Good morning, everyone. My name is Azeem Hill. I'm a senior at West Philly High, and I'm the captain of the West Philly Hybrid X team. And I'm uh, Simon Hogger. I'm the director of the team, and we're really, really excited to be here today. Um, we really appreciate this opportunity. Uh, a couple days ago, Azeem and I were sitting in one of the coffee shops trying to figure out what theme we fit into best. Um, we realize that all of our breakthroughs have been improbable. We've had a ton of failure, uh, way more than our fair share. Um, but we thought that we would want to kind of hone in on the brilliant accident. So as we were wrestling with how uh, brilliant accidents fit into what we do, I realized that most people think Azeem is brilliant. Um, my parents conceived me by accident, so today we're going to be your brilliant accident. <laughs> So to give some context to this story, um, I want to go back a little bit. How did we arrive here? Uh, I grew up in Philly. I um, attended public schools and graduated from public schools in Philly. And <clears throat> I graduated from Drexel University in engineering in 1993. My senior year of uh, college, I had a religious experience. Um, I know this is Saturday morning and not Sunday, so I, I won't bore you with the details. But um, I mention it because it's important. For the first time in my life, I really felt, felt freed up to think about what my passions and my dreams were. And as I considered that question deeply, I realized I didn't want to be an engineer, that I really wanted to be an urban educator. And in 1996, my dream came true. I found myself teaching at West Philadelphia High School in the very neighborhood I grew up. West Philly is one of the most challenging schools in Philadelphia. And <clears throat> Like most young idealistic teachers, I knew that I was going to change that place. I went in there with lots of passion, lots of energy, and a little bit too much arrogance. Um, my first year was very humbling. The other thing that was happening my first year was that uh, I was working with shop teachers. I had put me in the auto academy as the math science teacher, and I was amazed. These guys were brilliant, smarter than the engineers I worked with at GE. And yet, when we sat in a classroom, to do professional development, they're ready to pull their eyeballs out. You stick them in the shop, and they would solve prob very complex problems. And so this idea of a multiple intelligence really started to come to life for me. And as a young teacher, I was struggling with that. What does that mean in the classroom if, if everybody doesn't fit into this mold? You know, I, I've come to believe that we're all very intelligent. We're all very smart. Intelligence is definitely not one size fits all. And yet, for the most part, schools are one size fits all. And if you fit in, that's great. But if you don't, then what? So the other thing that was going on, I came in. It was like the honeymoon uh, period, the first year of teaching. I was so excited to be there. And yet there's all this dysfunction going on in the schools. And so I was trying to make sense of this. Um, how do we engage kids in different ways? And how do we make space for teachers like myself to make sense of this mess? And out of those two ideas, the after school program was birthed. <clears throat> We started off uh, small. Kids created an electric go-kart and did a science fair project that first year. It was the first year West Philly had won anything in the science fair. We took second place. We were really excited. The following year, <clears throat> the students decided to convert a Jeep to electric power, and we went back to the science fair. And they actually won the Philadelphia Science Fair. Out of 600 uh, entries, kids from West Philly won. And it was an amazing experience. And, I went back to them and said, what do you want to do now? And they said, we want to build a car that we can race. And so they developed, <laughs> they developed uh, an electric-powered Saturn. And we took this to the Tour de Sol, uh, the 2000 Tour de Sol, which was a road rally for uh, environmentally friendly vehicles. We were the first team of color to compete in that competition, and we had a wonderful time. They went back, and they, uh, we went back in 2001, and, and they kept working on this car, and they refined it to a point where it got 180 miles per gallon equivalent. That year in the Tour de Sol, there was 40 other teams, top universities, MIT, and we took first place. We beat MIT. <laughs> uh, MIT didn't feel like that, by the way. <laughs> so we, the other amazing thing that happened there was that Toyota and Honda were, were using it as a test market to roll out their new Prius and Insight. And so my kids, who are not the demographic, by the way, for that, that car, uh, <laughs> realized that hybrids were the future. And, I, and thinking back on it, if only GM realized that at the point, um, things might look a little different. But they, as, as kids, they knew that this technology was here. 
Um, and they also thought something was missing, so I challenged them to think about that. And we went back and, and feeling like we could do anything, we just won the Tour de Soul, and having them consider um, this problem, what was missing? And they felt like hybrids weren't cool enough. They needed to be cool if they were gonna catch on. And so they said, well, let's build a badass hybrid. Now, <laughs> it takes kids to think of something like that. Those two words don't usually find themselves in the same sentence. But, um, and so we did. Uh, we developed the world's first hybrid supercar. Um, a very fast, very fuel efficient, uh, very clean car. And we went back to the Tour de Sol in uh, 2005 and won. We painted the car and went back in 2006 and won. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and that led us to the place where uh, Azim was a freshman and we were trying to figure out what our next big competition was. And he's gonna tell you a little bit about that. So uh, when I was a freshman three years ago, we heard about the Automotive XPRIZE competition. The mission of the XPRIZE was to inspire a new generation of super efficient vehicles that could help break America's addiction to oil and stem the effects of climate change. The XPRIZE had a $10 million prize for the teams that could build a car that gets over 100 miles per gallon equivalent. These cars had to be safe, clean, and most of all, marketable. We built two cars for the XPRIZE. Not only do we want to show the world that we could build cars that get over 100 miles per gallon, but we wanted to show that it could be done using off-the-shelf American-made technology. Our mainstream car was a Ford Focus that we converted to a plug-in hybrid. With a price tag of about $25,000, this car was designed for the urban market. It gets 130 miles per gallon in the city and 80 on the highway. Our other car is a teenage boy's dream come true, and a middle-aged man's dream come true. <laughs> the GT is as fast as it is fuel efficient. It goes zero to 60 in less than five seconds, with a top speed of 150 miles per hour. It gets 100 miles per gallon in the city and 70 on the highway. Our cars and business plans surpass many of our competitors from around the world. They had million dollar budgets and paid professional engineers and MBAs to work around the clock. We had a shoestring budget, two dozen high school students, a couple of teachers, and a dream. There were 111 teams from around the world that were accepted into the XPRIZE. We were the only high school competing. We made it through several elimination rounds all the way to the semifinals. We beat MIT again, <laughs> Cornell, and a host of multi-million dollar startup companies. And even though we did not win the X Prize, in many ways, it felt like we did. So, what are the takeaways? Um, <laughs> so, I've put my 10,000 hours in. Um, uh, <laughs> We've learned a crap load about electric and hybrid vehicle technology. And I just need to pause for a second because my wife's here and uh, I want to thank her for giving me that time. Um, this was an after school program, so 10,000 hours after school kind of is difficult to support. Um, and I really appreciate her support. Um, uh, thank you. <laughs> you. But more importantly, what we learned more about is what makes good education work. Um, there's obviously a lot of conversation around reform, and there's some great reform going on, but in our district and in many large districts, the reform is more of the same. It's more test taking, it's more regurgitation of facts. Um, and what we found is, and many other progressive uh, educational programs have found, is that by creating good space for kids, by challenging them with real problems to solve, by supporting their ideas, giving their, them space to exercise their creativity and to tap into their gifts, their intelligences. Um, things like this happen. And 13 years ago, I'd have never imagined that we would be uh, in a competition like the X Prize. Uh, that wasn't the game plan. It was just trying to make space for teachers and kids to do good work. So I guess one of the things that happens when we start to talk about problem-based and project-based education is, is folks think that um, people that support that don't support basic skills, and it's quite to the contrary. 
we've seen amazing basic skills developed. We've seen um, young people develop public speaking skills, deep problem solving skills, and um, what I would consider as essential skills. And uh, I don't know why people think that when you start to talk about progressive education, we stand around and sing kumbaya and hold hands, but that's not what it is. It's really about finding what kids' interests and passions are and tapping into that. So um, as a math teacher, and I wanted to illustrate this point, kind of showing how this logic is flawed. If we continue to shove more content into school and require our kids to memorize more and more and more information and not slow down and give them space to really dig deep, which is what most uh, of the leading countries do, um, we're not going to see really uh, any systemic change. And so to illustrate this, I'm going to give you guys a quiz. And I, this might not work well because uh, we've got kind of an intellectual nerdy crowd here, but uh, I'm going to give it a shot anyway. Um, if you graduated high school, and I'm assuming you all did, uh, you took Algebra 2. And if you took Algebra 2, one of the fundamental concepts in Algebra 2 was the quadratic formula. So you ready? I'm, I'm not getting any. All right. <laughs> no love here. Uh, all right, we don't have time. The, the time's clicking. We're, we're running behind. So um, how many people really think, without looking at your friend's iPad or whispering in each other's ears, could solve this problem? About half of you. That's fantastic. Good, good. <laughs> um, do I have any, like, super math geniuses that can tell me the answer off the top of their head? Whew, good. <laughs> uh, so this is the solution to that problem. Um, usually, schools stop at that point. Now, what's the application of that? If I were to graph that solution, I did the quadratic equation in high school, and I was amazed when I got in college and we did engineering problems. Like, oh, man, this actually means something? Holy cow. They didn't tell us that. Um, but we stopped there. And the kids, you get the information, you regurgitate it on the test, and then you're on to the next concept. And so um, if you graph that, those points are the x-intercepts. And this has an application in all sorts of real life problems. Um, so the question that I have for you all is that the folks that failed that high stakes test, how are you successful today without knowing that content? <laughs> Azim's going to tell you a little bit more about his learning experience. So three years ago, when we had conversations about joining the XPRIZE, I can say now with pride that we had no idea what we were getting ourselves into. <clears throat> Our team has been on this Discovery Channel, Good Morning America, documentaries, and many more media outlets. I was one of the four students that recently went to the White House to meet the president in person. I would ne have never expected to have such an opportunity just three years ago. So many people came to our school to support us. The mayor comes all the time. Senators <laughs> and congressmen, the head of the EPA, Lisa Jackson, and the director of NASA, Dr. Braun. They both visited us. We even had a visit from, the, from Wyclef John who rat battled one of the students. It was amazing in student laws. <laughs> <laughs> All along the way, I've been to meetings about so many different subjects. We discussed everything from vehicle design to trying to figure out why our car isn't working for the fifth time this week. We research aerodynamics and fuel efficiency. We write letters and we write speeches. I learned to do more with the team than I do in all my classes in a row at a desk on a piece of paper. Students volunteer their time to do this work because we have a space where our ideas matter. And while I'm learning about things like the coefficient of drag and how to write a speech, there's something more important going on. I'm thinking critically. I'm solving problems. You can't teach critical thinking skills without critical conditions. You can't talk about the problems that students have without involving us. Young people are naturally creative. We wonder why many high school students are disengaged, bored, and not interested in school. We've created an environment that doesn't tap into our natural creativity. Most students, most schools condition students to regurgitate answers. They just prepare us to, to be better test takers, not creative thinkers. The driving framework of our team is that all of the work is real. If I fail my test, then I get a bad grade. If I do a bad job on the car, a wheel might fly off and we lose the race. Or worse, my teacher dies. <laughs> and if I write a boring speech, our story is misinterpreted. If our cars don't influence the auto industry, our country's air quality won't improve. 
And most importantly, we need schools that develop leaders and problem solvers, not test takers. That's how you end the dropout crisis. So many people have asked us, what's our next dream? Uh, what are we going to do next? And uh, what we really want to do, kind of from the motivation of the students and seeing all that we've accomplished in after school program, is to start a school based on these ideas. Um, and you can learn more about that at our website. And we wanted to conclude by giving the president the last few words. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to encourage others to be part of this growing movement, to harness the incredible potential for our young people. For, while this may be a difficult time for our nation, and we face some tough challenges, it's that potential that ought to give us hope. We need no better example than the students who are here today from West Philadelphia High School. Uh, these students, under the direction of some terrific teachers, entered a global competition against serious corporate and college challengers to build a production-ready car that runs on very little fuel. So as part of an after-school program, they worked to get their vehicles ready. They tweaked the hybrid engine. They figured out how to make their cars run more efficiently. At first, the adults didn't really think their team had a chance. Admit it. <laughs> but then something strange happened. Where older and more seasoned teams failed, they succeeded, even making it through an elimination round. Now, they didn't win the competition. You know, they're kids. Come on. <laughs> but they did build a car that got more than 65 miles per gallon. They went toe-to-toe -to -toe with car companies and big-name universities. <laughs> Went against big name universities, well-funded rivals. They held their own. They didn't have a lot of money. They didn't have the best equipment. They certainly didn't have every advantage in life. What they had was a program that challenged them to solve problems and to work together to learn and build and create. And that's the kind of spirit and ingenuity that we have to foster. That's the potential that we can harness all across America. That's what will help our young people to fulfill their promise to realize their dreams, and to help this nation succeed in the years to come. Uh, and I, I, I just have to editorialize. This uh, is the kind of thing that just isn't going to get a lot of attention initially. This will not lead the nightly news. You won't see this on uh, the cover of Roll Call or Politico. Uh, it's not, doesn't have conflict and uh, uh, controversy behind it. But, but these are actually the kinds of things that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, we're going to look back and say this is something that made a difference.